Good morning and welcome to a webinar hosted by the US Department of Agriculture and the California Department of Food and Agriculture. My name is Gloria Montaño Green. I am the Deputy Undersecretary for Farm Production and Conservation. We hosted a live webinar last week, which we've recorded and published on the website. We had a few technical difficulties, but are now moving forward to be able to have this as an opportunity for questions and answers. So thank you for making time out of your important day to be able to look at resources along the Department of U.S. Department of Agriculture available to your communities and agriculture and rural communities in California. Looks so like we have a very good set of attendance, so I'm going to start by giving some uh, very basic guidelines and um, that could be able to help so we can have this question and answer. Next slide, please. So we are using Microsoft Teams Live's event. What we can do, if you can have closed captioning, you can use the turn on live, keep ca live captions preview function listed in the event menu. <clears throat> if you would like to turn that on, if you need to pause the meeting, you can click the pause button found in the lower left corner of your screen. You can then click the button again to play from where you left off or jump to real time by clicking live which is located next to the play button. We are recording the session in case you experience any technical difficulties and for anyone that's unable to make today's events. We will share the posting of the recording after uh, and be able to make that live for sharing, similar to the website of the recording we did of last week's event. Next slide. One more. Uh, so Microsoft, if I could go back, Microsoft Teams Lives does have options for you to be able to submit questions. Um, if you will look on your screen, there is a Q&A section. Please uh, post your questions there and we will begin to be able to answer those questions. Before we begin our presentations, I'd like to introduce Undersecretary Christine Birdsong, who's been a great partner to make sure that we are educating up and down the state of California on the resources available to agriculture and rural communities. Undersecretary Birdsong. Good morning and thank you so much. Big thank you to our USDA partners for this follow up to last week's meeting. I know there are still so many questions out in farm country about how to access disaster resources. This is very, very helpful to all of those individuals and businesses. I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that I know that many farms and businesses are still recovering from the atmospheric rivers of January, February and March. And I know that there are also a lot of farmers, ranchers, dairies, and businesses that are pivoting to prepare for future flooding in the Central Valley. Of course, I'm talking about the snow melt we are expecting from the historic snowpack up in the Sierras, which on the one hand, we are of course very grateful for. On the other hand, is causing a whole series of new headaches for agriculture. So I think this presentation is timely for recovering from what happened and preparing for what is possibly going to happen in coming weeks. Um, so thank you again. I'm very grateful for everybody who's on and receiving this information and please take full advantage of the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Undersecretary. So next we'll hear from State Director for Rural Development, uh, Maria Gallegos Herrera. Maria? Good morning. Um, it's so great to be with everybody here this morning. As was mentioned, my name is Maria Gallego Serrera, and I have the honor of serving as the California State Director for USDA Rural Development. Uh, in light of the presentation that was given last week, I'm going to do a summarized overview of what it is we have here to offer at Rural Development. Uh, but uh, I'll just say that our focus is really improving the quality of life and economic uh, and the economy in rural America. We have uh, several programs today. I will just touch on about four or five um, and, and to really highlight that we have programs to help individual homeowners, uh, communities and um, rural businesses. So I'll start with um, the most popular program, which is our Home Repair Programs, which is offered year round and provides loans and grants to low income homeowners across um, across California, specifically those living in communities of 35,000 or less. Um, this is one of our most popular programs during disasters because we are often given the flexibility to offer additional grants uh, and at times waive the age restrictions. Uh, so at times we're able to offer up to $40,000 uh, for, for repairs. 
and um, and can use this resource in combination with other resources that may be available. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also uh, help uh, folks with uh, being able to purchase homes. Again, another program that's offered year round, but uh, we have seen people use these programs uh, during disasters, especially if they need to rebuild completely. So um, there are lots of opportunities here to get uh, None, uh, assistance that you know where folks don't have to put uh, down payment assistance and whatnot. Um, the other programs related to communities uh, is is um, next slide is the community facilities programs that are, are designed to ins ensure uh, ensure that there's um, adequate and essential uh, public services in communities and. Um, during a disaster, we can use these funds to fund emergency equipment such as uh, ABs, radio, fire trucks, uh, you name it. And then lastly, uh, we have the community facilities, pro uh, sorry, the emergency community water assistance grant that's available to uh, help ensure that communities continue to deliver safe drinking water. Uh, through this program, um, we can offer anywhere from um, you know, up to a million dollars for for construction of new water sources, treatment facilities, or extension of lines, or up to one hundred and fifty thousand in grants to, uh, you know, do necessary repairs or to address maintenance issues uh, needed to replenish the water supply. So um, again, you know, feel free to reach out to us on the business side. We do have traditional programs that ensure that we have financing available to continue to ensure that rural businesses are available uh, in rural communities. And um, for more information, please uh, feel free to reach out uh, to us. Uh, we have 18 offices across the state of California with our main office in Davis and also have a website with tons of information, program fact sheets in multiple languages, as well as um, we have Twitter. So feel free to follow us on Twitter as well to be um, to keep up with what it is that we are offering. And we also have um, a newsletter that folks can can sign up for. So um, with that, I will um, wrap up and um, not sure who's up next. Thank you, Maria. Uh, so just a reminder, if you have any questions about any of the disaster programs or items available to please uh, write your question in the Q&A. Next, we're going to have Navdi Dillon with Farm Service Agency. Good morning. Uh, my name is Navdi Dillon. I'm the Farm Program Chief for California, and uh, we're going to go over just a few of the programs um, that FSA has available. Um, the first program that we're going to look at is the Emergency Conservation Program. I did a more in-depth uh, review of this program um, on our webinar last week, and it's posted. Uh, the link to that is posted in the um, in the Q&A session for this meeting. Um, so right now I'm just going to do a quick overview. Um, this program basically it's it's to provide assistance to bring land back to pre-disaster conditions. So any everything, anything from debris removal to fence replacement to conservation structures is available. This is available to uh, producers who are farm have farmland, grazing land, um, dairy operations. So we will assist in providing uh, cost share up to 75% to bring your uh, farming operation to pre-disaster conditions. You can request a 25% advance of the approved amount uh, once the agency has done a field visit and is able to determine the needs and feasibility of, of the assistance that's requested. Next, pro next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Um, emergency loans are available because the majority of the counties in California um, were, were designated at, had received a presidential designation. Emergency loans are available. Um, the, you must suffer at least a 30% loss in production in order for you to be eligible for the emergency loans. And one of the requirements that's in place is that you must not be able to obtain credit elsewhere. And um, and you have within um, you have eight months from the time that we've received the designation to apply for these emergency loans. Next slide. 
Tree Assistance Program provides assistance to uh, producers who grow, who have trees or vines, and they are able to be assist in replanting um, the the trees or the vines. And there, we also provide assistance in preparing the land for replanting. We do require that you file a notice of loss within 90 days of when the event ha happens or when the loss is apparent. Um, there are some limitations that are that come into play for this programs as they are mentioned um, on this current slide. Next slide. Non-crop, non-insured disaster assistance programs is FSA's uh, crop insurance. So this is available for any producer who, any who grows a crop or crop insurance is not available through uh, risk management agency. Um, this program does uh, provide uh, assistance to socially disadvantaged limited resource producers where we waive the administrative fee and uh, we also reduce the uh, premium by 50%. Next slide. Um, livestock indemnity program provides assistance to producers of, of livestock whose life who lose their livestock due to an uh, eligible disaster condition or whose livestock are, are injured because of the eligible livestock uh, disaster condition. Um, you do have to file a notice of loss within 30 days of when the loss becomes apparent or when the disaster event happens. We do request, we do require that you provide proof of death or injury as part of the payment process. Next slide. Um, Emergency Livestock Assistance Program provides um, livestock producers again uh, for where they lose, if they lose access to um, grazing land or where there is, uh, where they lose um, their stored feed, stored purchased feed. Um, this program does require notice of loss within 30 days of when the loss becomes apparent to the producer. Next slide. Um, the ELAP program also provides assistance to honeybee producers. If you have, if you're a producer that produces honey, or is in the business, the business of pollinating or honey breeding. Um, we do provide assistance if you lose your colonies, hives, or stored feed. Um, any losses in excess of 22% are covered. Um, for this program, you do have to file a notice of loss with loss within 15 days of when the loss becomes apparent to you. Next slide. And you can contact FSA. We do have uh, 30, 30 some offices throughout the state of California. You can go to farmers.gov to find a location near you. OK, back to um, NRCS, please. Thank you, Navdeep. And a reminder to please uh, end your questions in the Q&A. So next we're going to hear from Ernesto La Cruz from NRCS. Uh, Ernesto? Hello, everyone. Ernesto de Arriba, the state watching here in NRCS. I'll be talking quickly about uh, the Emergency Watership Protection Program, better known as EWP. Uh, just a quick overview on EWP, it is a program set aside to assist eligible sponsors uh, with pediments in a watershed, most likely after a disaster. Uh, the eligibility requirements you can find right there, but you know, it must be something caused by a natural disaster, like I mentioned before, to cause a pediment in that watershed. And there are requirements for who can be into the program, mostly has to be like local governments, tribal organizations, other typical sponsors. Uh, Go to the next slide. OK, the limitations in EWP, um, typically when a disaster does happen, that there have, after 60 days uh, is when the, typically you need to like request assistance and we have to request those disaster funds. Work in DWP uh, if it's an exigency, meaning like an immediate threat to life and property. Uh, can't be given funds right away, but it has to be done in 10 days for our non exigency projects, not, not an immediate threat to life and property. That kind of work can be done up in 220 days. So it really depends when we go out there and assess the sites to figure out what is most appropriate for every site. Uh, I did put some more limitations on there. I'm going to keep this moving. Uh, getting started, please contact your local NRCS office. Uh, they're more than willing to help. They'll go out there to assess eligibility to know what's going on. Uh, and that will just do the, the cooperative agreement and work with the sponsor throughout the process and helping them to complete work and get that. Get the work done under this program. Uh, again, like I said, eligible sponsors, they're mentioned down there. 
uh, one of the main things to know on this program is you must have the land rights and the permits to work. Um, those are a must. Go next slide. Uh, the other program I'll talk about is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, known formally as EQIP under the Farm Bill. That program, you can apply for natural disaster funds. It gives flexibilities during disasters to address certain things that could have happened on farms. Uh, disasters, look, if you can see down there, as far as such as the floods, fires, hurricanes, any kind of disaster that could have happened that had an impact to, to producers, uh, there is that fund pool that's available for those disasters, and it's tailored for the type of disaster that happens in that particular watershed. So that is another program that's available, and this one's more available to individual farm farm owners. Uh, as you can see right there, uh, it has to address the concern of that particular disaster. So in the case of flooding, stream bank erosion, you know, so it's the most likely practice. In the cases of fire, depending on what those impacts are in the fire where that they could be addressed. Uh, typically funds are expected within 60 and 90 days of those disasters, you know, for request of assistance. As you can see there, that's where you can stay tuned for anything for NRCS California. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. I'm sorry for uh, mispronunciation of the last name. So again, reminder to please put your questions in the Q&A. We have a few already. So I believe this one is for rural development. In the previous webinar, it was noted that applications for home repair was typically limited to elderly, but that waivers may be granted on the age limit. Is that being done in the current disaster? Uh, Maria, I believe that's for rural development. Uh, thank you for the question. Just to clarify, our home repair programs um, is available to low-income homeowners across the state of California, uh, particularly those living in communities with a population of 35,000 or less. Uh, the limitation in terms of grants that's that's usually uh, um, that 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 this, that is available is is that the grants are usually available only to folks that are 62 and and older, but during a disaster, depending on the funding sources that are made available to rural development, we have at times been able to uh, waive that age restriction. Um, the key thing, and that is being that is uh, something we're utilizing during this disaster. The key thing is though that um, the rural areas, the the rural the homes must be located in rural areas that in in counties that were previously designated. Uh, where there's a presidential declared uh, disaster for calendar year 2022 or where rural development has requested uh, an accept exception from a national office. So uh, it is evolving every day uh, and set, you know, the list of eligible counties where we can uh, waive that age restriction changes. So what the best thing to do here is to contact our office uh, to ask whether um, you can qualify for either that increased grant dollar amount or if the age restriction is is being uh, lifted. But uh, I will say that there are already people that are availing themselves to these dollars and where age uh, restriction isn't an issue. Thank you, Maria. Uh, so I have uh, two questions for Navdi. The first is every day in California, California sells milk every day, uh, adding to gross income, even during times of low milk prices. An average 1,000 cow dairy will have farm gate receipts of over 3 million. Uh, most of our dairies still have an average adjusted gross income that exceeds 900,000, which applies to most FSA programs. I don't think this is a specific program, but maybe thinking about the adjusted gross income. Um, if a dairy produces annual income, um, it's less than 900,000, would he or she still qualify for any of the programs? Um, or if the son or the dairy producer's son or daughter's personal income was less than 900,000, would they be eligible under the AGI cap? <clears throat> so now, Deb, it's not a specific program, uh, but might be some, my age program is a little bit different. So um, can you share some insight yes. on that question? Yes, yes, of course, yeah. Um, so the um, you, the AGI limitations are statutory requirements, so the agency doesn't necessarily have the option to waive those requirements. Um, we do have some programs where um, we can um, look at the current years 
um, AGI. Um, however, it's always AGI that we're that we're looking at, and so it depends on each of, each of the different programs. Um, as, as far as um, the sons or daughters qualifying for the AGI limitations, we do we do look at the AGI for um, the payment entities. So if it's a LLC or a corporation, we'll look at the AGI for the corporation and then also at the AGI of each of the members. So if the corporation apply is eligible in this case, then um, and if there are two members that are eligible and two that are not, we will pay the producers who are eligible their share of the payment. Um, and it's a little bit different in a partnership. If you have a partnership, we don't look at the partnership to AGI. We look at each individual member's AGI. So we are able to pay the shares that are eligible in 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 different cases. Um, and in each program, there are sometimes changes um, depending on you know what Congress is looking to compensate producers for. So there are some programs that have those exceptions and. Uh, um, when those programs out come out, we do try to make make sure that we differentiate where where those exceptions are available for for the AGI. Thank you. Okay, so the next question we have is going to be for NRCS, um, and is um, oh, where did it go? Has the EQIP program been leveraged to address water quality issues related to flooding events? Any examples of projects that might be replicated in California? So, I think it was Brandon, is that correct? You're going to be able to answer that one? Yes, good morning. Uh, as far as EQIP goes, we do have regular funding for a lot of water quality issues. Uh, the disaster funding that we have available right now could be used for that. It's, it's, we're still in the works of all the details of that. So um, there's there's a little bit up in the air, but we're we're working on it. So that's a something we'll definitely take into consideration. Great. Um, so I'm gonna ask, I think like FSA, I have well one for you. This is regarding the ELAP program. For the ELAP program, do cows have to be on pasture 100% of the time to meet requirements? You're on mute. No worries. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes. So actually, if if you're if you are eligible for ELAP, if your um, cattle do graze some of the time, they don't have to be on pasture the entire. Um, grazing period or or the or the entire crop year. So as long as they ha are on pasture some of the time and that pasture is not available for them due to the flooding, then we can uh, we can look at some compensation there under ELAP. And then Navdeep, we have a, a question or two that I think is more about understanding the Emergency Conservation Program ECP. Specifically, okay. a question is, when can growers who have applied and have had um, staff inspected expect payments? But I think there's also been uh, some understanding of going to the FSA office and talking about timing of reviews for the ECPs. Can you walk us through ECP a little bit? Yes, of course. Um, so the ECP program, um, we once you we uh, because we had such a high demand for ECP. Um, during the as 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 the flood events were happening, um, we are we did take names down of producers who contacted us, and we are right now going through the process of uh, doing field visits. Um, and field field visits are necessary so we can provide the producers the most benefits that's available under ECP. Um, sometimes you know the producers may not realize what what all is available you know, just under um under just uh under our debris removal um you know there are different options that are available under land leveling there are different options available depending on the severity of damage and the payment rates are different so um the field visits are are necessary and um and so we once we do the field visit um then within um most likely within 30 days or so, you should be able to, uh, we should issue a um, a letter to you, a, a contract of, of the amounts that are approved for you. Um, and uh, 
you can start you can start your practice once we've done the field visit um, and if you if you want to wait until you actually receive the approval so you know what type of assistance is available through FSA you can also do that as well um, this is a cost share program so we don't actually issue the payment until you complete the practice and submit your invoices uh, for to for so we can uh, we know that the practice is completed. Um, we do need to do a field visit to make sure um, that uh, that the practice is completed. However, um, the agency can't does have the ability to make some exceptions in a few cases, and and we will look at all the different options that are available. Um, and um, as, as I said, if there, if there is, um, once you receive your approval, you are able to request a 25% advance if needed to start your projects. Thank you. Navdeep, we actually have quite a few for FSA, so um, <laughs> thank you for your patience. But I do feel this one might have a little bit of NRCS and FSA. Um, we're going to go for for growers who lost crops due to flooding levy breaks, have delayed plantings due to flooded land and have lost and are losing market revenue by not being able to deliver commodities. What a relief is available to them? And we don't have with us at the moment risk management agency, but for those who have crop insurance, if you haven't already had a conversation with your uh, crop insurance provider to be able to talk about what you planned and what might be delayed or what loss of crops, I highly recommend that you make that call as soon as you can. So I'm going to start uh, with you, Navdeep, on some of the FSA side of it, and then we'll hand over to NRCS to be able to help understand some how the tools be able to match there. Navdeep? Sure. Um, OK, so the um, we write currently the only program where we can assist with uh, uh, with with pr pr preventive planted or crop losses is is our um, NAP program and uh, that's available for producers who for crops where crop insurance is not available and uh, that program the NAP program requires that you have purchase crop insurance before our application closing dates. We do have some exceptions to for for the for the NAP program. Um, recently, um, there was some changes to the program where it where we where we can use the producers um, CCC 860 as their application for coverage under the NAP program. So we are evaluating. Um, evaluating those losses and, and those producers who may be eligible. Um, you, what I recommend is that if you had uh, production losses um, or if you're not able to plant the crop, contact your local FSA office, file a notice of loss. At the same time, if you had crop insurance, you, you need to contact your crop insurance agent and file a claim with them as well. Um, and right now, I, some of you may be looking for a ad hoc disaster program um, that usually, you know, uh, we have it. And right now, we don't have anything available for the 2023 losses. This and and so at this point, we are administering the emergency relief program for the 2020 and 2021 losses. Um, however, for the 23 losses, we do not have a ad hoc disaster program available at this time. Thank you. And then um, Ernesto, Brandon, while the question was more about the commodities, I think there's also some quite some of that question about resources available that aren't loans uh, for whenever there's some damage in the farms. Could either of you provide a little bit more on what can be available for farmers? Yes, I can address that. If there's some structural damage uh, that would uh, that could be that could be done through equip. So if there's, uh, I guess with with flooding levy breaks that may not be on on um, that property, but if there is some structural things on the property, we could assist with that through equip. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so Navdeep, we're going to go back to an ECP question. If we could. Um, Thinking about enrollment, is emergency conservation a first in line for serve for payments? Um, does it how how does it work um, for individuals that are wanting to sign up, go to the office, or maybe have not been in the office yet? Um, well, this um, this is not a first come first serve um, 
uh, program, so we do we're, we're not concerned about funding for this program. However, um, as producers come in, uh, we try to um, and address those that as they come in, we try to go out and, and do those field visits. Um, and so it's, you know, if someone as if you're coming in, if you're coming to the program right now, uh, then, you know, you will have to wait until other producers who were there before you. Uh, for us to get out and 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 do our field visits, we are um, working with uh, the national office to request a jump teams to come provide assistance. We did have um, a jump team here about two weeks ago for two weeks, and uh, they provided some well needed assistance to our county offices, and they were able to make real real headway on the field visits. And so we are continuing with the jump teams, and we're hoping to make a lot of progress within the next month or so to get some assistance, um, get some of those field visits done. Thank you, Navdeep. Okay, so we had a question here regarding EQIP. So Brandon, how can we receive updates on EQIP planning as it pertains to water contamination? I'm I'm guessing this is in response to uh, the first question I addressed as far as uh, some of our the funding that we're working on right now. But I would highly recommend visiting with uh, your local field office and working with them to get get started on the planning process. And any of the uh, funding announcements that we have will be published through our website and and other. Uh, methods and, and the field office will definitely be aware of that as well. Thank you. So Navdeep, I think we have a question here. Uh, I um, Based on the question, I'm not too sure it's about our tree assistance program or um, the crop, but we'll read it to you. If you lost part of your tree crop during one of the hailstorms, will this cover any of the losses, assuming you do not have crop insurance? Um, so I think if you don't have crop concerns um, and it's an insurable crop um, in in California, then at this point we do not have any assistance available uh, for the product for the crop losses. Um, um, if you can apply for an emergency loan um, for assistance, the emergency loans has it up to five hundred thousand dollars. In assistance that's available, and the interest rate is, I believe, 3.75%. Um, and if the county was declared as an emergency, then um, you may be eligible for that. At this point, we do not have a ad hoc, ad hoc disaster program to provide assistance um, on production losses at this point, unless you had NAP coverage or crop insurance with RMA at this point. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to go back to either Brandon or Ernesto. There's a question here. Is there a funding limit for EQIP? There is a contract limit uh, of. Uh, 450,000. And. I, I assume that's what the question is is referring to. If somebody if the, who, yeah, sorry, go for it again. If if uh, there needs to be more clarification, let me know. So if there's a clarification on the question, put that back into queue and we'll ask that again. Um, okay, let me, the next question. Thank you all for the patience as we do this in real time. Um, if a producer, this is going to be for you, Navdi, regarding that. If a producer has not had damaged crops in some areas, but anticipates damage with the spring snow melt, could they sign up for NAP now? Um, no, this is NAP is an insurance program, so you have to have signed up by the application closing date. However, um, if you are a limited resource or associate disadvantage producer and you filed an 860, uh, with FSA um, prior to the application closing date um, for 2023, you may be eligible. 
Um, so you can contact your local FSA office and see and um, they can answer that question for you whether you had coverage under NAP using the 860 at this point or not. But um, uh, you do have to have purchased crop insurance um, or NAP coverage in order, in order for us to ask, assist in production losses at this point. So Navdeep, I am going to ask you a question which I know probably hasn't been answered yet because we are still working between um, the California FSA office and the headquarter office. This is regarding to dairy and livestock feed. Um, we're trying to work through our programs, but um, are there, will there be any programs that assist with loss of dairy livestock feed due to spoilage caused by the flooding? Uh at this point, um, I would say the end. If th those losses are not covered under ELAP unless your um, unless your livestock was also had access to grazing land, um, and it's a statutory statutory requirement that the ELAP is available to grazing animals, grazing livestock only. Um, and uh, I know the um, as Gloria said, the agency is working through that. Um, so at this point assistance is not available. However, always keep um, keep good records of your losses, take pictures, and then um, you can always file a notice of loss with the county office. It most likely will get denied due to the eligibility of the animals. However, at least at this point you have a record of with FSA in case anything changes or any additional programs become available. Thank you. Navdeep, I have on here another question about ECP, so I'm going to put it back to you. Um, the Emergency Conservation Program um, is very popular uh, to know. Um, we do have fact sheets on our website, so if you look at Farmers.gov Emergency Conservation Program, um, and then also I think in the communication you received on this, we provided uh, some guidance on hand um, guidebooks on it. But one of the questions is, have some of the 2023 ones been paid? Um, already for ECP, um, but I think we already walked through timing, but maybe we can walk through that again of how it occurs. Um, yes, so the um, ECP program, as I said, is the cost share program. Um, so once we approve your application, um, you have um, six months to complete the practice, and once the practice is completed, then um, then you can submit your invoices for payment. Um, at this point, we are approving contracts. I know we've had some approvals go out in um, in the Santa Maria office and a few in the Templeton and, and Salinas office. And uh, as we are finishing up the ECP field visits, we, we hope to get many, many more approvals out um, soon here. And um, and just to summarize, we can't issue payments until the practices are completed. Um, so that depends on how fast the producers are working and and when they turn in their um, notify the office that they've they're completed their practice once approval goes out. Gloria, you're muted. Thank you for that reminder. Um, so there's this one question I am going to take. This might be outside of USDA. This is regarding the Small Business Administration and if there's any loan assistance for farmers. We will take that question back um, and post it um, to the same page where you are able to find um, the Farmers.gov location on California work. Um, so just to be shared that one. Um, and then let me see, do we have anyone? Um, I think, uh, Navdeep, this might be for you as well, and this might have to be an individual case that comes into the field office or the service center to adjust, but uh, would welcome your thoughts on it. Are there resources for farmers who don't own the land but had a complete loss who also don't qualify for crop insurance? It's a loaded question. It has lots of situational items, I believe. Right. So, OK, so under um, so under the ECP program, you are you don't you're not required to own the land. ECP is available to the producer who is going to reestablish the farm or that land back to pre disaster condition. So if you're a tenant and you're the one who's completing doing all the debris removal and replacing all the irrigation systems, uh, do, you're, you're the one who's putting up the expenses, then 
then the tenant is the one who's eligible for ECP. Um, all of our other programs, um, same thing. It's it's the producer who had the risk in the crop that was lost is the one that's eligible for for our programs majority of the time. So for our livestock program, if you are the one who's who has interest in the livestock, then you are eligible for the programs. Um, you do not, you are not required to own um, own the land in order for you to qualify. It's just that you just have to show interest in the loss um, that was suffered. Oh, we have another ECP question. How can we get the 25% cost share up front for ECP? Um, so once if we once we do our field visits and uh, we approve your contract and at the approval at the time of the approval is when we you can request a 25% advance. Thanks, Navdeep. I'm going to keep you on the queue again. This is regarding NAP. Uh, for this year or next year, what are the deadlines for application of new NAP insurance plans? <clears throat> for the 20, um, so uh, let's see here, for the 2023, we have the application closing dates posted on the California intranet. So that's um, if you go to fsa.usda.gov and you click on California as the state, then um, we you know that you have access to all the application closing dates. I believe most of the 2023 application closing dates have passed. Um, and for the 24 crop year, our first application closing date is September 1st. This, this is for all of our fruits and vegetables um, throughout California. And uh, all of those dates are posted on, um, on our website. Thank you. We've put it into the published question and A of that link to be able to help uh, facilitate. Uh, and then one, I think this could be our last question, then we'll get ready to wrap up because we're here for 45 minutes. Thanks for everybody's patience on here. This uh, is regarding trees. I believe again, it's for you, Navdeep. Where would you apply if you lost actual young trees and not crops? Um, so you would apply at, with the local FSA office. It's the tree assistance program is what you're applying for. And uh, once you have filed the application, uh, we will send the loss suggester out to um, to do an on-site in on-site inspection. Um, and for the tree assistance program, there really isn't a waiting period um, for us to get a, a loss suggester out, so that could be done immediately. Once you're once we do the um, field, once loss suggester does the field visit, um, your application will be approved. Um, and then once you complete your practice um, and, and TAP is also a cost ship program. Once you are done replanting the trees, you turn in your invoices and then a payment is issued um, at that point. And there, there is no advanced payment available for the tree assistance program at this point. Thank you. So uh, we've answered quite a few questions. We did also have a time being conscious of the time. And uh, it looks like I missed a question. <laughs> uh, so some wine grape growers are experiencing loss due to frost. Are losses being measured? And in addition to crop insurance, what other relief may be available? I do want to remind folks before Navdeep answers that um, this we did not. Uh, sorry, we did not bring crop insurance on to the conversation risk management agency, uh, but we will work on uh, providing some information. But uh, Navdeep, with regards to FSA, is there any resources there to be aware of? Um, at this point for the 2023 freeze losses, um, we don't have a, a program um, available at this point. Um, it will it would have to be a program that's legislated by Congress to provide additional assistance in addition to your crop insurance um, benefits that you you would be receiving. Um, so for crop insurance, if you had crop insurance coverage, um, you need to contact your local your uh, crop insurance agent to file a notice of loss if you haven't done that already. Um, and uh, um, if there is production loss as a result of the of the freeze, then you will get assistance through crop insurance. Um, and then FSA 
if a program is legislated, um, uh, we will do our outreach to make sure everyone is aware once a program is announced. Thank you, Nati. Um, so under Secretary Birdsong, I'm going to give it to you to do a couple uh, closing comments if I could. Yes, thank you. Qu uh, thank you so much for this. So many questions. I really appreciate all of the USDA staff and your expertise in being available um, to, to give us these answers. I'm thinking uh, maybe from CDFA, we'll put together a follow-up email with a link to the original presentation from last week. Um, if possible, a link to this Q&A session if, if anyone wanted to go back and check an answer, some additional resources. But I think most importantly, uh, we'd like to try to connect you all with your local USDA SDA um, offices for more information and if you have more questions I can I can definitely tell um, that people are are working really trying hard to figure out these programs it can be a little daunting at the beginning but USDA as you learned through this session has really exemplary staff that will help you walk through all of the aspects of these programs and how to take advantage of them so big thank you again to USDA. Thank you, Undersecretary. I'd like to thank um, uh, Navdeep, Maria, Ernesto, and Brandon from uh, FSA, RD, and NRCS for your engagement. Uh, the producers that joined us today to be able to get more information about the resources. The number one thing is call your local service center. When in doubt, call them, I think is the, the connection. And there's usually an FSA, NRCS, and RD where they can connect you. Before I close out, I couldn't really do it without doing a quick reminder. The Ag Census is really important for us to be able to know and share information about what's happening in agriculture and to best help resources and to best um, uh, move forward. So there is still time to be able to respond to your Ag Census information. We encourage you to fill that out and we'll be putting a link in the published questions. Um, but with that, thank you all very much for your support, for your questions and working uh, together as we go through this disaster relief um, combined with USDA CDFA and with you. Have a great rest of your day.